Hi, everyone. I'm Mark Turner, president of the Gilroy Chamber of Commerce, and we are doing our eighth annual legislative summit. Again, this year, like last year, we are doing it virtually due to the pandemic, but we have great confidence that next year we'll be able to gather again and do this in person. Uh, with us today is Representative uh, Congresswoman Zoe Lofgren. She represents California's 19th district and has done so since 1995. She is the chair of the Subcommittee on Immigration and Citizenship. She's a chairperson of the Committee on House Administration. She is the chair of the California Democrat delegation. She's also on the Science Committee and she's on the Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress. That is an interesting committee, I'm sure. Congresswoman, thank you for being with us today. Well, thanks for having me. And uh, it's uh, nice to be with you virtually and I hope hopefully next year we'll be there in person. Indeed, I appreciate that. You've been, you know, I think you've only missed one year uh, for, for, for what reason have you had, but that was like three years ago. So I appreciate the fact that you come back year after year. We really do appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to be with us. So let's jump into it. We know, of course, the pandemic is what is on everybody's mind. And from your perspective and where you're at in, in Washington, can you give us an overview of, of kind of where things are at and, and uh, what you were experiencing? Well, uh, you know, we have really rallied around uh, to provide help to America during this pandemic. As you know, we did uh, two big COVID relief uh, bills to get uh, vaccine and uh, protective equipment out across it to help hospitals and healthcare systems, uh, testing and the like. Uh, we provided assistance to uh, states, but particularly uh, local governments and school districts that have taken a tremendous financial hit uh, just so we can keep everything together until uh, the scientists uh, have allowed us to put it in the rearview mirror. We just passed what we call the Rescue Act, which is a huge and important bill uh, that once again uh, accelerates uh, the vaccine distribution and testing. The testing has to go on even with the vaccine because as we know there are outbreaks even with the vaccine uh, rollout as well as additional assistance uh, to people. I mean the number of businesses especially small businesses who have been have struggled many have gone out of business. Uh, we extended uh, relief in the bankruptcy uh, uh, extension for small businesses. Uh, to keep more of their assets. Uh, we, we believe uh, that we're doing you know, a reasonably good job. Nobody's ever satisfied that it's fast enough in terms of vaccination. But when you compare us to other countries, I think only Israel has vaccinated uh, their population faster than we have. And uh, we're, we're keeping at it. Of course, here, not only am I voting uh, in Washington to do that, but I'm weighing in uh, with the White House to get um, accelerated vaccine distribution to Santa Clara County. I've been working with the, uh, especially Supervisor Chavez uh, and the County Executive, uh, Mr. Smith, Dr. Smith, um, to try and uh, accelerate direct allocation of vaccine to the various health clinics, including in Gilroy, uh, so that we, because vaccine shortfalls have been an issue. I mean, the county is capable of uh, vaccinating uh, 200,000 people uh, a month and uh, a week, pardon me. And um, they're only able to do 30 because of vaccine shortages. That's about to change as, as of actually last Thursday. Uh, uh, they accelerated the distribution of vaccine to the uh, community uh, clinics. And so, uh, you know, that is really picking up the pace. And I think at some point, we don't know, you can have a date, um, but we'll be in a position uh, to have enough Americans vaccinated that this pandemic can be in the rear view mirror. And that will be a welcome day. Our economy will pick up and um, we can have a better future together. Indeed, yeah, I think everybody is looking forward to the time when somebody declares the pandemic being over. And we are starting, at least in Santa Clara County, 
uh, seeing the fact that we're in the uh, tier where it allows 50% occupancy in restaurants. And, and so we're seeing a lot more activity, the weather's warmer. And so there is what appears to be more hope on the horizon. And so that's been a good thing. Congresswoman, you had mentioned the Rescue Act, and, and I, I believe that's the one where there's a lot of criticism. And I'm just wondering from your perspective, how do you address that criticism when they talk about uh, so much of a smaller percentage of that money is really being allotted or allocated for the coronavirus and so much other money is being used for different things? How would you address that? Well, I just think that's it's incorrect. I mean, I, it depends on what you uh, think the American people need. I think if cities and counties across the country are about to go belly up and fire all their first responders and lay off their doctors and nurses, that's COVID related. It's because the tax revenues have fallen apart because the economy took a hit because of COVID. So similarly, uh, the, the funding we put in for schools, I mean, the school uh, funding base has fallen apart across the United States because of the economic hit. So it's all connected. And, uh, you know, we want to get out of this pandemic intact. Uh, we've lost a lot of people, hundreds of thousands of Americans who've died. More Americans have died from COVID than than all the world wars put together. Uh, the, the wars from World War II, Korea and Vietnam, you put all those deaths together, it doesn't match uh, the number of Americans that, that we've lost to this, to this dreadful disease. People and families are mourning across the country because of it. And uh, businesses are, I can't tell you the number of small business people I've talked to or just barely hanging on. And so we want them to be able to hang on. We've extended uh, relief efforts to restaurants uh, because the restaurant industry took a tremendous hit. And not only the restaurant owners, but all their employees are you know, really barely making it. We provided assistance for people who are gonna default on their mortgages. The last thing we need in the middle of a pandemic is, is a epidemic of default. So everybody loses not only a member of their family, but their home. So uh, it was designed to be broad and uh, I think it will help our country a great deal. Very good, thank you, Congresswoman. Now, if we could, we'll jump into another topic here. Immigration is certainly uh, in the news quite often. And what we do know is that there is, you know, no matter what you call it, people come up with different names for, whether it's a crisis, a disaster, a problem, certainly some challenges exist uh, at the border. I know that in March, uh, it was probably one of our, it was a record month for crossings. There were 19,000 unaccompanied children who came across. Uh, you're on the, uh, the immigration committee and you chair that. What, what is it from, from your perspective and, and uh, could you say, whether it's the administration, the, the, the Biden administration, or from what you're working on in Congress, what, what's the best answer here? How do we, how do we resolve this problem? Well, I think you need to take a look at the, what is causing this situation? And, and it's uh, not any one thing, but more than 95% of those children come from three countries. Uh, they come from El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala. So if you only look at, you know, what are these children doing showing up at our, at our, our front, our back door, but why are they there? You have to look at where they came from. Uh, you don't see thousands of children fleeing from Costa Rica or from Belize or from Panama. No, it's those three countries. And uh, it relates to conditions in those countries. Um, so I think, you know, a little bit less than half of the children have close family members, like a parent in the United States. That's a function of a dysfunctional immigration system. Uh, you know, we had a, a program uh, earlier that the prior administration dismantled that children who were seeking to be unified with their parents in the US could apply uh, in the, their home country, uh, be vetted and sorted there. And if um, they met the criteria could simply fly to the US and meet their parent. They wouldn't have to take that treacherous journey. But the other half of the kids, uh, imagine what it would take for you 
to take your 11 year old child and send them alone up to another country. Uh, you wouldn't do that for no uh, good reason. And the reason is the violence uh, that is epidemic in these three countries. The corruption is um, a, a serious problem. As a matter of fact, the president of Honduras, his brother is being prosecuted by the Drug Enforcement uh, Agency here in the US for uh, his involvement with the cartels. And there are reports that the president of Honduras himself is involved with the drug cartels. When I visited El Salvador uh, with a congressional group, uh, you know, one of the uh, non-governmental employees told me that uh, there were whole swaths of the country that were ruled by uh, drug cartels and gangs. He said it was like ISIS without religion. Uh, so you've got beheadings, you've got assassinations, you've got children being kidnapped and being put into prostitution and parents are trying to save their families' lives. So obviously we want to uh, deal with children in a way that's, that's caring and uh, respects their dignity and their need for safety. But if we don't take a look at what's going on in those three countries, we've missed a big bet. And that is something that President Biden uh, has indicated he wants to do. Now, it can't just be the US dictating that, that'll never work. Um, but we need to be in an alliance with other Western hemisphere countries to help those three countries get a grip and have the rule of law once again be instituted. It starts by not supporting the corrupt people that are running those countries. I mean, we have supported the Honduran president uh, when he cheated in the last election in the Organization of American States that he hadn't won, we supported uh, the, the Honduran president who was in bed with the cartel. So we need to actually support those uh, in uh, those three countries who are seeking to have uh, the rule of law once again. Uh, and, because in the end, uh, you know, this, is, this can't be solved at our border. This has to be solved in Central America. And, and that's a good point. I mean, if you look back over administration after administration, whether Republican or Democrat, all have faced challenges at the border. And with these three countries that you were, you were mentioning, what is it that we could do differently today that say we haven't done or been able to do over the last four or five administrations, which again, include both Republican and Democrat administrations. Is there, is there anything that could be done? Well, I say for the first thing is you stop supporting the people that are perpetrating the violence. In the case of Honduras, the president himself, you start supporting those, uh, uh, not just the US, but working with other Western hemisphere countries to support those who are seeking uh, to have civil society and the rule of law in, and there are people in, in those countries that are trying to do that. They're being uh, brutalized in some cases. Uh, uh, there was a land reformer in Honduras who uh, was assassinated by uh, the Honduran government. So it's, it's not a just flip a switch and you can change everything. Um, but I do think working through, you can't hand money to the Honduran government when they're the ones that are perpetrating this, but there are non-governmental organizations, there are religious organizations, there are other civil institutions that are fighting uh, the corruption and violence. We need to help strengthen them. Um, and a lot of people say, well, they're so poor. Well, they are poor, but, but Costa Rica is poor too. People aren't fleeing from Costa Rica. Belize is, is as poor as these other these three countries. People aren't fleeing from Belize. People will stay even if it's not a, an affluent country that you're in, if they can stay safely. Because people, think of your own life. You wouldn't leave your family, your neighbors, the place where your ancestors are, are buried in the, in the cemetery down the road. I mean, you have, you, you, you're rooted in a place and you don't leave for a frivolous reason, um, but you would leave if the choice was get killed or flee. That's a good point, I appreciate that, thank you. We can move on now to uh, the topic of technology. Of course, uh, here we are in the heart of Silicon Valley 
And the, of course, the, the concern of uh, intellectual property is always a big one. I know that you've worked on this for years. Uh, the theft of U.S. intellectual property is of great concern. And of course, who comes to the top of mind, of course, but China. China is a, uh, responsible for about 80% of all cases charged in economic espionage. Uh, and of course, there's others around the world. But how, how does, uh, first of all, how does Silicon Valley address that concern? And from a congressional perspective, what work is being done in order to, uh, to help Silicon Valley companies? Well, first, we have to have a strong uh, patent system. And we have taken legislative steps to strengthen the patent system. And I'm sure uh, some of the inventors down in South County may have been up to the patent office in San Jose. We now have uh, several uh, satellite offices that have worked, it's worked very well uh, to have the patent examiners so close to the inventors so that you can have a dialogue. And it actually not only helps with the patent process, but also helps educate the patent examiners uh, for cutting edge material. That's the basis. Uh, you need to have something that is protected under law. Now, if you have theft, which is what you're addressing, it's like stealing anything else. Uh, you have to use law enforcement uh, to protect against uh, theft by individuals and you have to use the force of the nation uh, when it's coordinated by uh, another state. We do, you know, opinions vary about whether this is actually being directed by the government of China or whether it's entities within China. In, in either case, it's a theft and needs to be fought by making sure that we have uh, adequate resources uh, uh, for our law enforcement agency, especially uh, the FBI, and that we have uh, the kind of collaboration that I'm personally aware of that occurs between uh, technology companies and law enforcement agencies to protect themselves. Very good, thank you. Education, of course, is our next topic. I wanna to talk briefly about that and, and uh, getting students back to the classroom. There's so many various side effects that you think about when uh, you look at distance learning for the extended period of time that we have done that now. It's been a year. Some schools are starting to make their way back to the classroom. But uh, what are your thoughts on this? And how do, we, how do we do this in a way that certainly keeps teachers and students safe, but uh, get students back to the classroom so that their learning opportunities expand, they're, they are able to get caught up in some estimates uh, students can be, you know, and we've seen this where high performing students are somehow not doing as well. And at the same time, some who are lower performing are doing better. But overall, the concern is that uh, performance is down. Uh, there's uh, so many emotional challenges that go along with this. From your perspective, what, what do we need to do in order to get uh, students back in the classroom and get, uh, get that going again? Well, obviously, the pandemic took a terrific toll on everything, including education. And uh, uh, the educational system was unable to function. And I think uh, partly educators were concerned, uh, but also parents were concerned. I mean, it's, it's a myth that children can't get this disease. And I talked to plenty of parents who are worried about their, the achievement of their children, but less worried about that than will their child survive. So um, hopefully that's pretty much in the rear view mirror now. Uh, we are vaccinating the teachers. Um, a lot of the uh, transmission issues has to do with adequate ventilation in schools. We've learned a lot about the disease that we didn't know a year ago. And uh, we're in uh, early testing. We will have the answers pretty soon on uh, vaccine suitability for young uh, children as well. So I think we will be have the kids back in school, uh, hopefully this fall. Uh, some school districts are opening up uh, this spring. I worry about you know the deficit. So some kids actually uh, thrived on this, but I think the bulk of kids had problems with it and are going to be behind. I personally believe that we ought to be as a country looking at uh, summer school and uh, other efforts to get kids caught up. Um, you know, it wasn't their fault that the whole world was uh, uh, overwhelmed by this pandemic, and we don't want them to pay a permanent educational price for it. 
Right, and boy, you'd see so many school districts who really, we saw it here in Gilroy, just pivot on a dime, getting the uh, distance learning up and running, the things that they did to ensure that people had technology that they needed. It really was a Herculean effort. Well, and it, it, it was amazing, really. If you think about it, Mark, you know, we went from everything normal to co complete disruption in a couple of weeks. And uh, the schools, I mean, obviously mistakes were made. You're, you, that's going to happen when you've got that kind of pivot all over the country. But I give a lot of credit to, to teachers and to parents. I mean, what parents did is just amazing. I mean, the heroes of this whole thing are the parents of America who, with their teachers uh, and their kids, tried to get everyone through this. And it's not been easy. Um, but pulling together, we did it. And we're, we will come out, I think, a stronger, a stronger country. Absolutely. Yeah, you're right. And parents stepped up in a way that were, was just simply amazing, trying to balance home life, education of their children, their work schedules. It's been an amazing thing to watch. And uh, I know some have struggled, of course, and others have excelled, again, in, in just like students have. But boy, I'll tell you that I, I have great respect for these parents who were able to make that work and do what they did. So one of the last items I wanted to mention to you and talk with you just briefly about was a year ago when you and I talked by, by, by way of Zoom, we brought the, uh, the ADA challenges that we find in South County we began working with uh, one of your staff members. I just want to check in with you on that and see if it's something that we can continue to keep moving forward. Well, I so hope so, Mark. And as you know, as we discussed last year, uh, the Americans with Disability Act is a very important law, and it does protect uh, people who are in wheelchairs and who have other disabilities, gives them access and dignity. It's very important. And it really makes me furious when people uh, take advantage of a law that is so important and abuse it, um, and which is happening in some cases. And we know some uh, some notorious cases where basically uh, someone has looked for some technical minor issue. It's sort of professional plaintiffs, um, and uh, it's abusive. And we need to have a resolution. The interesting thing is, the federal law does not provide for uh, monetary damages. So it's the interplay between California law and the federal law that makes California particularly vulnerable. And one of the, it's hard to change a law, as you know. Um, but I think probably the answer lies more in California than it does in, in, in the federal law, which already excludes monetary damages. But they're bootstrapping a California law mm -hmm. to kind of hold hostage um, and, and extort uh, uh, settlements is, is, is how it's going. So uh, we don't have a solution to that yet, I'll be honest, but it is something that does need a solution. And I am going to have to say goodbye because I have a room full of people waiting for me at noon on the next Zoom meeting. I will let you go. Thank you for that. I'll continue to work with your staff and with you on that ADA uh, situation we're facing. But Congresswoman, thank you for your time. We appreciate you being here with us and joining us for uh, our 2021 Legislative Summit. Thank you, I'll see you soon. Thank you.